Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this opportunity to gather together to study your word. Father, we look forward to this Revelation chapter 13, 13 part 2 that Eddie has prepared for us. And Father, we are seeking knowledge, but along with knowledge, most importantly, Father, we seek your wisdom. Yes. We seek your understanding. Give us understanding, Father, and in the meaning of uh, the prophecy that you have uh, put forth this evening, Lord. Yes. We pray that you'll bless Eddie, uh, give him the words to speak, and open our hearts to the message. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. We're going to, uh, what I'd like to do is do a review of last week <clears throat> before we go into the second part about the beast that comes up out of the sea, because tonight we're going to look at the beast that comes up out of the earth. And <clears throat> we're also going to discover that if, starting at verse 12, we're going to move into things that are yet future for us. Uh, and when that happens, um, you know, it, it can can be a little confusing to us, perhaps even unbelievable. Uh, in fact, much of what we learn tonight might seem almost impossible, just as John could not understand how the beast of Revelation 13 could prevent the whole world from buying and selling. I mean, back then, that was probably a pretty big thing to write down in faith, that the whole world would not would have the uh, commerce of buying and selling uh, as a way to control people. How is that possible? Uh, well, today we know it's possible because of technology, the technology of digital money. You know, the world, we're moving more and more towards a cashless society where those dollar bills you've got won't mean anything. In fact, I think a lot of places have stopped using coins. So it would be real easy uh, through uh, debit cards, uh, cryptocurrency, all of those things that are digital for, uh, for that, uh, to, that whole commerce to be uh, controlled. So even though it was by faith that John wrote it, it's something that we can see actually happen. I'll tell you a little story. Uh, I was one of the first people in Nashville back in the uh, 70s that installed the first ATM in Nashville. And to me, it was fascinating to find out that you could put a card in a machine and get cash back out of it or put an envelope in there and make a deposit. But that was just the beginning, and uh, it's gotten a lot more complicated since then. I want to bring up my little cartoon uh, again, because I like this. Uh, and this is one of those topics um, where we, you know, do we want to hear what God has said or what we'd rather hear? You know, a lot of times we don't want to hear things because it may rub us the wrong way. And I hope what I'm going to show you tonight doesn't rub you the wrong way. Um, I'm just presenting what, um, what I've see from the Bible, and I want to stick as close as I can to Bible and, and the verification of history as I present this tonight. Okay, does anybody know what this is? Dashboard. Dashboard. What do you notice, uh, Corey, about that dashboard? Uh, either you're starting it or you got an epic failure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you got uh, all these warning lights, uh, and our society is kind of like these warning lights, uh, uh, like the warning lights on the dash of a car. They're flashing red lights all over the place in our society. Crime, you know, that's a warning light. Uh, deep division among the people, another warning light. Drug addiction, uh, diminishing or shortage of resources, warning no immigration management. You know, we got drugs coming across our borders. Moral decline, homelessness, the economy slowing down, the cost of groceries and gas, you name it. There's warning lights going all over the place telling us that something's about to happen. Uh, you know, God had given Paul some warnings uh, 
you know, in the last days, people will be unthankful, unholy, disobedient. Their parents, I mean, just goes on and on. Uh, so, and it's interesting if you read this, just a little side note, this is not in my notes, but um, if you read those warnings, you think it's about the people that are in the world and not in the church, but look real careful at the context. This is about people that have fallen away, as Paul says. It's an interesting study in itself when you consider that most of the warnings in the Bible were written towards the church, not to those that had, who have no interest in God or, uh, or anything spiritual. Um, <clears throat> now, I'll, I'm going to give you a disclaimer here tonight. <laughs> here's, here's one of the disclaimers. Uh, the contents of the following are not intended to accuse individuals. There are many priests and faithful believers in the Roman Catholic in Roman Catholicism who serve God to the best of their ability and are seen by God as his children. I'm sure of that. Uh, and the reason I know that, by the way, is because God calls them out of Babylon, out of confusion, uh, out of the uh, confusion of the Roman papacy. The information contained herein is directed only towards the Roman Catholic uh, religio-political uh, system that has reigned in varying degrees of power for nearly two millennia. Under the influence of its successive popes, bishops, and cardinals, this system has established an increasing number of doctrines and statements that clearly go against scripture. And we saw that last week, didn't we? Uh, we saw quite a bit of claims by uh, the, uh, the papacy that are not according to scripture. Right. Um, and, if, and if you're a Protestant, which I think everyone here is, then right. you realize your church had the basis of saying, yeah, we don't want to follow that because it's not following scripture. Yeah. And, and so all, all the Protestant churches marched off in a different direction, hopefully toward Jesus Christ. Yeah. Unfortunately, some of them are, are kind of returning back to the mama church there. Well, um, we have, a lot of people have forgotten why there was a separation. Yeah, that's right. Uh, another disclaimer that I don't come up here, but I want to reiterate, it's not the desire of Charlie, Larry, or myself to convert you to our particular denomination. As I've said over and over, and I believe this to be true, that God's people are in every church, including the Roman Catholic Church. And what you do with this information is entirely up to you. You can believe it, you can reject it, you can embrace it, you can throw it away. But most of all, what Charlie, Larry, and I want you to do is to study for yourself, draw near to Jesus. That's our objective. We hope that this will bless you. Whenever I talk about the, the beasts of Revelation 13, I try my darndest to keep it. <laughs> Christ in the center of this. So I want to share with you a chart. I don't know how well y'all can see this. Uh, I will be sending it out in the notes, but uh, Charlie's done a really good job here of letting us compare the uh, little horn of Daniel 7, how it compares with this sea beast of Revelation 13 and also uh, how that relates to or finds its fulfillment in Rome. Uh, what I, the only thing I would have added to this chart, uh, Charlie, is the uh, description that John gives of the Antichrist. Oh, uh, yeah. And Paul mentions the man of perdition. Uh, so really, all, all of those are pointing towards the papacy, the Antichrist, the Little Horn, the Sea Beast, uh, all of those refer to the papacy. And if you know, knowing now that what we know about the papacy is you look at the Antichrist and all that, you'll begin to appreciate the power that God has to predict the future. Uh, here's one. Of, here's the one uh, that I'll give you as an example. This is Paul talking to the Thessalonians. He says, let no one deceive you by any means for that day, which is the second coming of Christ, will not come unless the falling away 
comes first. And we talked about that a little bit, how the churches would begin to fall away from the pure gospel. And, and the man of sin uh, is revealed the son of perdition. So, and this goes very well with Revelation, where it talks about this beast being revealed, uh, who imposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped. Now, notice the word exalts himself, because we're going to come back to that tonight. So that he sits in the God of temple, in, as God, in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And we did look at some passages last week where the Pope uh, claims to be the vicar or the replacement for Christ and has all this power to do all things uh, related to religion. And uh, we're going to see that again here in just a second. I'm going to go real quickly through the 10 of identifying marks. This time I've added verses to it. Last time I didn't have them. It's a power arising after Greece, comes up out of the sea, multitudes of war. It's a power that comes from the 10 divisions of Rome. And I won't go over all these. You saw them last week, and I will include them in the notes. Now, I do want to bring your attention to Daniel 7 and also Revelation 13, because uh, this kind of uh, goes with what we're saying here. And these are two good summary verses. Uh, after this, Daniel says, I saw the night visions and behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong, and it had huge iron teeth. It was devouring and breaking in pieces and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that was before it and had 10 horns. As I was considering the horns and there was another horn, the little one coming up among them before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and mouth speaking pompous words. We've seen how the papacy, the rise of the papacy fits this to the T. Uh, in fact, even those uh, three horns were the Vandals, the Herli, and the Ostrogoths that were uh, plucked up. They were opposing the Pope and he just simply annihilated them. Now the beast which I saw was like a leper. His feet was like the feet of a bear, his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and his great authority. Again, we're, we're looking at this two very similar uh, or same things in these two passages separated by hundreds of years. Uh, continuing on of the 10 identifying marks, must be a religious and civil power. And this 1260 years, it keeps popping up over and over, gave us a definite time that this power would rule from 538 AD to 1798. And uh, it would have a suspension in its power and go into captivity. Uh, uh, here's one of the verses. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life, slain from the foundation of the world. So here we're talking about this worldwide worship, every tribe, tongue, nation, the ones that... Uh, that uh, are protected, as we've talked about, are those that are sealed by the Spirit of God and whose names have been written in the book of life. Uh, granted, by the way, here means it means to give authority. So they worship the dragon. And who gave, uh, who gave the authority to the beast? It was the dragon that gives the authority. And uh, the last three here, it must have the wound healed, the whole world give it respect and have this number. Again, we saw that last week, how in 1929, the uh, Prime Minister Benito Mussolini and Cardinal Gasperi signed an accord whereby the, the uh, 
papacy received back its religious and political power that had been suspended from 1798 through 1929. And did the world wander after the beast? Of course. We see pictures like this on the news often. Um, cardinals kissing, kissing the hand of the, the Pope. Massive crowds. Uh, this is the largest church in the world. And of course, we looked at the uh, number. I always say this for last. It's a fun little puzzle here. But you take the Roman, uh, I'm sorry, the Latin Roman numerals, that's right, Roman numerals, and apply numbers to the vicarious vilia di, which means vicar of Christ. Uh, it's the number of a man, and the Pope is a man, and uh, that number comes out to 666. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> yeah. um, now, I actually found an 11th <laughs> identifying mark that kind of gets overlooked. And I guess I could have combined some of the others to make it 10, but we'll just call it number 11. Uh, this beast must blaspheme God by intending to change times and laws. Um, let me read this to you here. Again, this is back to Daniel 7, verse 25. He shall speak pompous words. Pompous means solemn or self-important. Solemn or self-important words against the Most High shall persecute the saints of the Most High. Again, we're talking about this beast. And shall intend to change times and law. Now, we know that this can't be just political type laws because those laws change all the time. But we're talking about the Im immutable law of God can God's law be changed? Does God say something and say, well, you know, I changed my mind on that. <laughs> um, and we saw how the papacy tried to change the time, literal time, uh, and, it, and actually su succeeded at it, where time changes at midnight uh, from one day to, uh, to another, where God had said the evening and the morning were the first day long before there was a Jew, that's the way God counted the next day. Um, it was when the sun went down, that day ended and the new day began. Still a practice among uh, the Jewish people to this day. And he would, again, there's that time, times and half a times that this pompous words from this um, beast would rule. Now I showed you this chart uh, last time, and you can see that two of these commandments are struck out. Uh, this one is not struck out, it's just changed. This one's totally out, but this one, the beast claims to have ch uh, changed. Now, what I'd like to do is read some of the, like I did last time, I'm going to read some of the quotes from the papacy about their claim of changing this fourth commandment to read a different way. And by the way, it's the third commandment in the catechism, but to read a different way. So hang on, I've only got about three or four slides. I don't want to belabor the point here, but I do want to show you that this power is indeed thinking to change times and God's law. Here was a question that was posed to, to uh, a Roman Catholic priest. It says, questions, the question is, have you any other way of proving that the church has power to institute festivals of precept? Now, I had to look up what festivals of precept meant because I'm not a, a good Catholic. <laughs> Actually, that means a holy day of obligation. The simple answer is that it's a holy day that's important. That's an important feast. Is it um, one you must observe? Is that what that means? Yes, you must observe it. In fact, it's, uh, let me read this to you. It's a feast of our, this is them talking. The feast of our Lord, our Lady, or other saints that Catholics are morally obliged to observe by participating in the celebration of the Eucharist 
and by abstaining from unnecessary servile work. These days are made solemn, uh, solemn, like Sunday in terms of festivity and observance because of their special importance and meaning for the universal or local church. In the United States, they have six holy days. Each, you know, for example, uh, I think Good Friday is one of those. Holy days do vary from one country to another. So they have, this question is, do you have some proof of proving you have the power to make a day holy, right? So the answer said to the priest says, had she not such power, she could not have done that in which all modern religionists agree with her. She could not have substituted the observance of Sunday, the first day of the week, for the observance of Saturday, the seventh day, a change for which there's no scriptural authority. And there's your reference there. Uh, another similar quote, Cardinal Gibbons, which is well known for uh, Faith of Our Fathers, uh, that publication, he claimed that Sunday keeping was the mark now get this, the mark of Roman Catholic authority. Of course, the Catholic Church claims that the change was her act. So they make no bones about it. They make that the change from Sunday, from Saturday to Sunday, or Sabbath to the first day of the week, was her act. It could not have been otherwise, as none in those days would have dreamed of doing anything it, in matters spiritual, ecclesiastical, and religious without her. This act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power and authority in religious matters. So imagine that. <laughs> the papacy says our act of changing the day of worship is a mark of our power and our authority in religious matters. Now, is that not pompous? words yeah you know they're, they're sitting there basically saying we're the little horn power we're the little power <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah because they're claiming to do these things mm -hmm. and, and as, as to show you they have power uh and like i say because people are saying what makes you think you can tell us things as if you're god right basically right. That's what it and well it says well if we if we weren't like god we couldn't make these changes. And therefore, since we've made the changes and everyone's following them, yeah, we're, mm -hmm. we, have the, we have the authority. And it's a, it's a little frightening that they're sort of callous at saying the words they're doing, like it's the mark of our authority. You're going, really? You're using those words? <laughs> yeah. It goes on to say that Sunday is a Catholic institution and claims to observe, to, to observance can be defended only on Catholic principles. So again, pretty haughty words. I, I researched this Cardinal Gibbon some. He, he lived back in the 1800s and he made this, isn't it interesting about the time of the Reformation that was going on during those times. He was outspoken in his praise for American democratic institutions and he advocated Americanization. And what he meant by that was the rapid assimilation of Catholic immigrants into American culture and institutions, both as a means to counter Protestant Americans suspicious towards Catholics and to avoid the fragmentation of the Catholic Church in the United States along ethnic lines. Now, if you'll remember why this country was founded, <laughs> uh, people were coming from Europe for a lot of reasons, but one of the main reasons was they were escaping a culture that was run by a king uh, and the church was run by a pope. And so they said, we want a country that's founded without a king and without a pope. And that's why we have uh, religious freedom to this day. But the dangerous thing, Eddie, was that the pope had civil power too. Yes. And so they yes. could enact laws to enforce their religious philosophies or beliefs. Right. So if you did not agree with them, they had, remember the inquisitions that went on for so centuries? Mm. Uh, basically, if you were found to be heretical, in other words, you didn't agree with the Pope, 
you are you are you're under penalty of imprisonment, torture, and death. Right. Yeah. yeah. So God bless America. <laughs> that we are, oh, yeah. We are, that that's we why. That's why country. people said, "I'll take the risk of being at sea for four or five months and coming to a land where there are no places to get food, so I have to go and maybe starve to death. I'd rather do that than live under that oppression." Yeah. Well, I'm going to read this. This is kind of long, but this will be the last one. So you can take a deep breath here. I'll, I'm going to move on to another part of the this study. Uh, here in the Catholic record, um, we see this statement, and we also see a dialogue going on between uh, a Protestant and uh, a Catholic. It says, the Catholic says, the church is above the Bible. And the transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. This was in 1923. He goes on to say, you will tell me that Saturday was the Jewish Sabbath, but the Christian Sabbath has been changed to Sunday. Changed, but by whom? Who, is, uh, who has authority to change an express commandment of Almighty God? When God has spoken and said, thou shalt keep holy the seventh day, who shall dare say, nay, thou mayest work and do all manner of worldly business on the seventh day, but thou shalt keep holy the first day in its stead. This is the most important question, which I know not how you can answer. You are a Protestant, and you profess to go by the Bible and the Bible only, and yet it is so important a matter as the observance of one day in seven as a holy day, you go against the plain letter of the Bible and put another day in the place of that which has commanded. The command to keep holy the seventh day is one of the Ten Commandments. You believe that the other nine are still binding. Who gave you authority to tamper with the fourth? If you're consistent with your own principle, if you really follow the Bible and the Bible only, you ought to be able to produce some portion of the New Testament in which the fourth commandment is expressly altered. So this uh, Catholic is really getting on to this Protestant uh, in his argument. But um, so this just shows you the boldness of the uh, Roman Catholic papacy. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, um, once, once again, he is using this as a as a means to argue that the catholic church does have power and authority and mm -hmm. can do things which we only think god can do right so that's, that extends now to changing times and laws and also shows the forgiveness of sin and as you said before when we look at it they claim to be as it were a god on earth mm -hmm. so. well i say jesus is lord of the sabbath not amen the <laughs> Uh, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. Oh. Exodus 20.10, and it's repeated in uh, Luke 6.5. And he said to them, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. Now, I, I want to say something here, too. Um, this might be kind of new information to a lot of folks. And, um, you know, uh, there are eight verses in uh, the New Testament that talk about the first day of the week. Uh, there's a passage that talks about the Lord's Day in Revelation. We've seen it, and it really doesn't tell us which day the Lord's Day is, although this passage would seem to indicate it would be the Sabbath. But I did a, a study on those eight verses to see if Jesus or the apostles uh, changed the Sabbath. And um, if anybody's interested, let me know, and I'll send that to them. And you can kind of look that over and see what you think. Again, I'm not trying to make you part of my denomination or anything. I just want to put that information out there so you can see see it and accept it, reject it, do whatever you want to. It's uh, it's uh, just information. Yeah. You know, when Jesus made that proclamation, he was actually defending the Sabbath, right? Because there are all sorts of people who were trying to put rules and regulations on the Sabbath to make it a burden. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the church was actually doing the devil's work, if you will, because they were, make, they were making the, the Sabbath, which was a joyous thing to remember your creator, into a burden. And, yeah. And so that was, that's why the Lord said, hey, you know, it's the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath and, uh, and is made for man. It's, right. It's made as a gift. So. 
Yeah. yeah, and actually there's a passage in Revelation, or I'm sorry, Isaiah. It says, if you call the Sabbath a delight, <laughs> you know, the Sabbath was, was meant by God to be a time of rest and delight and communion with him. And of course, the Jews turned it into a, a bunch of legalistic mumbo jumbo. <laughs> I like this verse in Isaiah 66, and I'll get off of this uh, after this passage here, but we all know that we're going to have a new heavens and a new earth, right? <laughs> God's going to destroy Amen. this earth. And uh, what a great time that'll be, all of us together. He says, for the, as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants in your name remain. That's an interesting thing I'd love to talk about. But And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, that's monthly, right? And from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. So there's a very good indication that in what we would refer to as heaven or the new heavens and new earth, that we'll be worshiping together on the Sabbath. Uh, very, very enlightening verse there. Amen. Another chart that Charlie put together that I really like. <laughs> uh, here he's talking about the laws concerning worship, and it falls into these two categories. Uh, idols, remember it, the, the beast took that one completely out. Uh, and he's put the passages there, Exodus 20, you shall not make to yourself a carved image of any likeness of anything that's in heaven above or in the earth beneath, or, yeah, et cetera. So he's, God doesn't want us to create images and bow ourselves down and worship them because that's an idol. <laughs> you know, I've heard uh, Catholics say, well, we don't really worship. We just bow before them. Well, if Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they could have done the same thing when they were told to bow. Instead, they stayed upright. They could have said, well, I'm not really worshiping. I'm just going to bow here so I don't have to die. So uh, at, at, whether we're in the act of worship, whatever, it's not a good thing to make an image and, and uh, give it any kind of affection. <laughs> um, I, I, I did. I did. Paul, and this is a little thing there in Romans 125. I said, wow, he's really he's really touching on the main point here. Because the devil or the dragon wants you to worship a created thing, right? right. That's him. Right? Serve the creature rather than right. the creator. Yeah. yeah. And so by by loosening this up, so you don't have to worship just a creator. You can worship a created thing. This opens it up for Satan to receive worship, which I think yeah. was pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Uh, and right in the middle of the commandment, <clears throat> it says to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And it made, it gives you the reason why God made it holy uh, because of his creatorship. For in six days, the Lord made heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the seventh day and hallowed it. Now, isn't it interesting that and Charlie's going to bring this out next week that the three angels messages has a call that says fear God and worship him who made and it quotes the same thing here I'm not going to steal your thunder right. but that first angel's message refers us back to this passage um, I like this passage in Ezekiel 20 verse 20 uh, where uh, Ezekiel is or God's talking he says hollow my Sabbaths for they will be a sign between me and you that you may know that I am the Lord your God. So the Sabbath is a way of identifying the true creator God. It's, um, and, you know, I will say this too. Um, and, and like I told Larry and them, uh, Charlie last night, look, you can worship any day of the week. You know, God doesn't limit us to, uh, to worship. The fourth commandment is more about which day do we honor and keep holy. Uh, and of course, worship would be a vital part of that. And uh, Charlie's going to talk about that with the uh, three angels messages next week. But um, this is not, like I say, it's not about which day you go to church. <laughs> it's about which day is kept holy and honored. Um 
Well, so, and but it, you see, the, you see the attack. So, right, one attack says, "Oh, it's okay to worship created things," and the other one says, "Oh, you don't have to worship the creator, right?" Mm -hmm. And if I get rid of this commandment that refers to creation, then I don't worship and creation are not linked anymore. Right. And uh, I think you know when I think about how that's positioning the beast, uh, the dragon, and the image of the beast to take worship, which is what the devil desires in our worship. It's it's really it's really pretty creative on their part to do to make those changes, but it almost has to happen in order to do that. Okay. Okay, so what we're kind of saying here is the great controversy in Revelation is all about worship. <laughs> Satan wants the whole world to worship worship him. So he decides to make a few adjustments to take away the identifying marks of the one and only true God. So I'm um, going ask you this question. Can there be any doubt who is the beast of Revelation 13 and the false teachings that uh, actually replace Jesus Christ? The word antichrist is not necessarily against Christ as much as it is a replacement. Uh, I, I, the other day I called myself the anti-Job, <laughs> which meant that uh, when I went through my little uh, Job experience. I did the exact opposite of what Job did because um, I didn't respond the way he did. So the Antichrist is one that's trying to replace Christ. And we've seen that through many of, and I've got tons of other statements that they make in accordance with that. Yeah. And that chart that you passed by that had, you know, the little, little, uh, little horn power. Oh. Right, right, right there. It, it yeah. talks about how that when he claims to have authority, he claims things that are really interesting. One is the, the ability to forgive sin. And yes. It's way up there, right? And that the priest has the power to forgive sin. And I was doing some reading on it. It says, yeah, as soon as he says it, it happens, right? It doesn't happen until mm -hmm. he says it. And another, another thing had a, a difference of sin. Have you ever heard of venial sins versus uh, mortal sins? You know, that's a... It's sort of interesting that in that their vernacular, there is a different levels of sin. And, you know, God doesn't do that. He says there's a state called sin and there's a state that's where you're reconciled to me. But venial sins, they said, you can go to God to get forgiveness from those. But mortal sins, you have to go to a priest. Yeah. I, you know, we're talking about uh, blasphemy here. And right. we, we talked about that last week. Forgiving sins is one of them. They accuse Jesus of blasphemy. Of course, right. he can forgive sin. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, and uh, anyone who claims to take the place of God, that's blasphemy. Mm -hmm. And also thinking that you are pompous enough to change uh, what Jesus said. I'm not going to change one jot or tittle. Don't think that. Uh, and then, you know, and he said, if a man teaches to break the least of these commandments, they'll be least in the kingdom of heaven. So anyway, uh, let's move on now to the second beast from the earth. Here it is. I've got 20 minutes. And actually, this last part goes pretty fast. And the reason is because uh, starting with chapter, uh, or I'm sorry, verse 12, this is verse 11. Once we go through this, everything becomes future. Uh, then I saw another beast coming out of the what? Earth. Earth. And he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. It's interesting to me that our national animal, the bison, uh, has two little small horns here. Uh, but whatever the case, uh, what power was coming up while the other one was going down. Remember, the other one went down in 1798. What other power was coming up around that time? A new nation. A new nation that was out of the earth. It didn't come up out of the sea, a multitude of peoples, but it came to a land that was mostly in, uninhabited, although there were quite a few uh, Indians, native Indians here at the time. But this this land was kind of assimilated, uh, and we could talk a lot about that. But anyway, it comes up out of the earth. And just a few notes about 
the United States, uh, as I mentioned, it came up out of the earth and not a sea or multitude of people through war, through land grabs, although this was a big land grab, but not necessarily by uh, the, the, the typical type of war. So first of all, the struggle of the American colonies for independence began in 1775. And in 1776, we declared ourselves independent from uh, Europe, or uh, England in particular, Britain. In 1777, delegates from the 13 original states assembled in Congress and adopted the Articles of Confederation. So we declared ourselves independent and then we went about making sure it was legal, right? In 1783, the, the Brits said, hold on a second. <laughs> we don't think we want to go. Uh, we don't, we don't want to let you go. So we're going to have a war with you. The war of the revolution against Britain ended with a treaty whereby the independence of the United States was acknowledged. So we whooped up on Britain. <laughs> And they said, okay, uh, the land is yours. And of course, in 1787, the Constitution was framed on July the 26th. It was uh, 1787. It was ratified. Then on March 1st, 1789 is when it went into effect. We the people, a nation for the people, of the people, and by the people. So as the beast was, that the sea beast was going down, this nation was coming up, but wait, you know, that beast's wound is going to be healed, and it happened in 1929. So from first verse 12 forward is the future. I'm about to show you that 12th verse, and you'll kind of see where we are in uh, prophecy. At this point, though, no one has the mark of the beast, whatever that might be, okay? It, we think it's probably going to be related to which authority do you choose? Do you choose the Roman Catholicism and choose to live? <laughs> or um, do you choose Jesus Christ in the Bible? Whose authority do you trust? Is it the beast, the papacy, or your creator God, the catechism or the Bible? Here are the two, two sides right here. Now, in verse 12, this is where it's all future. And the earth beast, and he, the earth beast, exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and accuses the, uh, and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast, which is the papacy, right? Whose deadly wound was healed he performs, he, that's the earth beast, performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of man. So deception is going to be the name of the game here. Great fire coming down from heaven. Can you think of another time when fire came down from heaven in the sight of men? Yes, that would have been Elijah. Elijah, exactly. Uh, yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, this is a counterfeit of that. Uh, this uh, there's a miracle that is performed here that relates to fire, and again, this is future, so I don't know. I can only speculate, but the purpose of that is to cause this uh, cause everyone to worship the papacy, the first beast. Uh, and uh, this, it, he also has all the authority of the first beast. Well, what authority does the first beast have? It claims to have ecle ecclesiastical, religious, and civil power to even do things like make changes to God's law, uh, to be the supreme ruler of the church. But there will come a union between the United States and the papacy if we understand what the earth beast and the sea beast is, and I've, I think we've shown pretty conclusively who the first beast is, and the earth beast is coming up when the other one is going down. And he, again, we're talking about the earth beast. 
deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which was granted to, to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. So it's interesting that, uh, you know, miracles, false miracles will be part of the deception. Um, an image implies something similar, but not the actual thing. It's a likeness. It has the same likeness as the Roman papacy. The combination of church and state and forces people to comply with her commands. There's a very strong possibility, and we see this in our newscasts, that our religious freedoms are being trashed, <laughs> and the government is getting more and more involved in things that are religion, religious. That's why it always uh, makes me a little nervous when I see the government trying to make decisions about religion. An example of that is prayer in school that was taken out by the, the government uh, and trying to, uh, you know, control uh, anything in colleges that relate to religion. They don't want to have it. They want to knock it out, you know. So the lamb is transformed into and speaks as a dragon. This innocent, we know what a lamb represents, right? What does a lamb represent? Pure innocence. Pure innocence and also a person, right? Yeah, Jesus. Jesus Christ. So this nation started uh, much like a, a, a lamb. It was based on Christian principles. But it's going to change and begin to speak like a dragon. And we know what the, what the dragon represents, Satan, right? So I, could, I would expect that perhaps if, if we're probably already on this track of this transformation all you have to do is kind of keep up with the news and you'll see this transformation going on um the first be here's a quote from uriah smith which i thought was interesting related to this he says the first beast as an agent of the dragon uses its power in state affairs to enforce religious laws resulting in the persecution of heretics who would not submit. For America to do this and give life into the image of the beast, it would have to abandon the principles of religious freedom, repudiate the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, and discard the fundamental beliefs that have made this great nation what it is. When America uses its power to enforce religious laws and persuades other governments to do the same, it creates an image to the beast and gives life reflecting the intolerance and persecutions of the medieval papal church. I thought that was a pretty strong comment from uh, Uriah Smith identifying what the United States, if they do, what that if it's the, the start of creating this image to the beast. Now we're moving through to the last few verses of Revelation 13. We'll be through here in about five minutes. So hang on with me here. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast. He is, is referring to the earth beast. Granted power to give breath to the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many who, as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. So there's a death decree here. <laughs> he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave. That's everybody. Poor people, free people, slave people, great people, famous people, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. And that they may, no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now, we've talked about how the mark in the right hand is symbolic of accepting the, uh, the mark in order to be able to buy and sell. While the mark on the forehead is one that person that acknowledges and is deceived so that they receive the mark. 
But again, there's pressure put on by not being able to buy or sell. I asked uh, Judy, after I finished this study, I walked into the bedroom and I said, Judy, what would you do if starting today, we could not buy groceries, we could not sell anything to get money to buy, we would just have to depend upon God himself. <laughs> and she said, and uh, at first uh, she was a little frightened about it, but then I reminded her of this passage here. There shall no evil befall you, neither shall any plague come near your dwelling. One thing that I know from um, uh, the stories of the Bible, Elijah being one of those, when there was a drought in the land, Elijah did not go thirsty. He did not go hungry. He was fed by the ravens, right? Yep. So God will protect those that have his seal those that are written in the book of life, they will have the almighty God protecting them during this time of trouble, as it were. And then, of course, the last verse, we've already talked about the number 666. Now, I want to con contrast what we've seen over and over in Revelation. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Charlie will talk about that in chapter 14 next week. But the, the big uh, contrast between the followers of the beast and the follower of Jesus are the ones that keep his commandments and the, and the faith of Jesus while the others are following the commands of the papacy. Whatever happens in the coming days, and I must admit, a lot of this just seems this far out, how could this ever happen in our United States? I, th I think that as we see things like what happened during COVID uh, and things of that nature, stuff that happened quickly, these final events will probably be quick ones. And, um, but uh, let us always remember whatever happens, if our hiding place is in Christ, we, we are protected. That is our hiding place is Christ. And I'll leave you with this question. Uh, uh, will you put your trust in Jesus or the beast? As I mentioned, we may not understand or know for sure about the beast and its mark, but you can come to Jesus and be sure of his protection through the tough times. You can rest in him. There's no one like him. Uh, I recently... Uh, uh, memorized a passage of scripture that means a lot to me, especially since I'm about to turn 72 years old. It's hard to believe. But uh, it's found in Psalms 71, verses 18 and 19. It says this, um, even when I am old and gray, do not forsake me, my God, till I declare your power to the next generation your mighty acts to all who are to come. Your righteousness, God, reaches to the heavens. You who have done great things, who is like you, God? So I'll leave you with that thought. And um, that is the end of Revelation 13. Any thoughts or comments or that you would like to? The words that uh, like in Roman numeral equals 666, where do those words come from? Oh, um, thank you for yeah, thank you for asking that. That's the one of the official titles of the Pope. Okay. The title is Vicarious Vidi. Uh, it's actually on the mitre of you know the thing that he puts on his head. It's not on every one of them, but there is one particular mitre that has his title. Vic Vicarious Vidi, of course, means Vicar of Christ, which is his vice sergeant or representative who has all this power uh, to to make changes and to do things. I'll send you, uh, Corey, in the notes. Uh, that will be part of the notes, and you can study that out. I encourage you all to study this out and see if it makes sense and compare it even with other uh other teachings out there we know that for example the futurists believe that 
hey, I don't have to worry about it because I'm not going to be here. They think the church is raptured away and the, the, that's when the Antichrist and the beast show up. But uh, Paul tells us uh, that that the spirit of the Antichrist was even during the times of um, when the disciples were there. And that spirit of the Antichrist is one of control, of uh, modifying the pure gospel. You can study and find that out. So it's, it's interesting, Eddie, that God is not a God of ambiguity. Right. Uh, yeah, there's a, th that book, Fifty Shades of Grey, a lot of ambiguity in Fifty Shades of Grey, right? Yeah. But, yeah. but God basically says, okay, you are you got my seal or you got his mark, right? So it's, and you have to make the choice. It's mm. not, there's no ambiguity there. You know, I'll, I'll, you know, I believe firmly that from what I've been studying here, that there will be people who, don't know who the beast is, doesn't don't know what the mark is. They've never had a study like this, but there's one thing that will save them. And that is the one thing that will save us all. And that's the blood of Christ, right. yeah. a relationship with him. So the is this is Jesus, right? <laughs> yeah, all the way. <laughs> next, next week, uh, when we go to Revelation 14, we're going to see 144,000 again. So we're going to see that sealed group, uh, which reminds us that we're sort of, we sort of still have some open open books. We have the seventh seal still open, and we have the seventh trumpet still open, and we're because we haven't, we have, we know where it's going. But we have some things to accomplish before it's completed. So the hundred forty four thousand shows up, and after all those trumpets we we saw, where he's trying, God's trying to change people's hearts. He's going after him one more time in the, in the three angels' messages in 14. So it's remarkable. Right. One thing that uh, you pointed out, Charlie, that I really uh, was an eye opener to me <clears throat> is that these uh, first six trumpets uh, and seals are all about uh, kind of like warnings. There's still opportunity to, to come to Christ. So we're, we're likely to see things like we saw 9-11, uh, things that will pull people back to Christ. But once we get to the seventh seal and the seventh bowl, this is when Christ is about to come. And we hear the words, he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. And he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. But, so there comes a time where the sheep and the goats are they're separated. Right. Yeah. 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 As I had word one pastor said, the amazing thing is some of those some of those goats mm -hmm. become sheep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good. Right. Yeah. It's true. So anyway, well, if there's any not any other thoughts or questions, we'll uh, sign off and thank you for your time. All right. Thanks, thank you, Eddie. Eddie thank Eddie. you for that study. Thanks, a lot, a lot yeah. Okay, I pray, pray that God will bless you all. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay, good night. Good night. Good night.